Good evening, namaste, welcome to this happy guru with me, Kirsty Bentley Taylor. Um, tonight we are continuing on our discussion about the divine masculine and feminine. I, uh, I waffled on for so long on my last program, I forgot to kind of add some things in at the end. So I'm bringing it home tonight, as I'm really hoping England are at the moment. I'm, I'm very excited. I'm embracing my masculine side and been watching the football through, through the, the World Cup. And uh, England are playing Croatia tonight, so I'm very excited about that. The energy's high, the energy's high. Um, but yeah, so today we well, really want to discuss... Um, masculine energy, feminine energy, the rise of both and how they complement one another. Because I feel like um, we, I've discussed a lot about how the characteristics um, of masculine and feminine energies are, how we can relate to them because of their characteristics, how we've all got the masculine, we've all got the feminine energy within us, and how if we harness the characteristics of these energies, we can almost kind of bring ourselves into this kind of superpower state where we are able to heal ourselves, where we're able to achieve what we want, where we're able to hold other people safe so that they can heal, so that they can heal themselves, so that we can really begin to make changes that will begin to heal the world um, and help ourselves for the future, you know, as well as just kind of for the here and now. Um, and as much as it's it, it, it's a fine dance between the masculine and the feminine. And this is the thing, you know, we're constantly reaching and leaning into one or the other. Um, when you bring that conscious awareness into the way that you work as an individual, when you begin to recognize in yourself the characteristics that are inherently masculine or inherently feminine in terms of energy, you can begin to separate and use your logic to really isolate out where you are strong, if you like, in which energy you're strongest, and in which energy you could do with kind of raising up, especially in certain areas. Things like relationships tend to have a lot of kind of conflict areas, um, careers as well, you know, so that's kind of the, the two kind of main conflict areas that we experience in the majority of time in our life, through our wanting to succeed in business, through our wanting to kind of earn money, have affluent lifestyles, all those sorts of things, and through wanting to have that same level of success within our personal interpersonal relationships. We find a, there's a lot of crossing over and there's a lot of blurring and it finds within the energies to be a kind of a mismatch of the two, where you lean into one strongly and it counterbalances and it tips the other. And so these are kind of the areas that I want you to really begin to look at within your own lives as to how you predominantly work. So, for example, as a woman, I would tend to lean more into my feminine traits within my feminine energy um, than I perhaps would with, with like if, if I was a man. If I was a man, I would be leaning more into my masculine just through my just through the characteristics, not through any kind of intent, not through any idea of ego or personification of the energies, but just with the way that I've been brought up, just with the way the characteristics of the male energy have manifest in our society, through our cultures, um, throughout our history. So all those sort of things are embedded within our psyche. Um, we're brought up in a society, culture, wherever you live in the world, that has developed over a long period of time. And within those cultures, they have isolated out these characteristics that are typical to the masculine, typical to the feminine, and either raise them up or push them down. Um, generally across the world, it seems to be more that the divine feminine has been pushed down in favor of elevating the masculine. And yet at this time in our history, uh, in our lives on, on this planet right now, we seem to be seeing a real shift in terms of the feminine energy. We are individually and collectively crying out for healing, for help, for love, um, for the acceptance that we need to be able to heal the world, not just environmentally, but also as a people, as a species. Um, I think the majority of people in the world are beginning to open their eyes to see the you know, the upset um, and the chaos that has almost been caused by the overpowering shadow masculine energy without its divine counterpart it's very hard for the masculine to remain divine it leans heavily into the ego it leans heavily into its more aggressive tendencies intolerance uh, violence aggressiveness uh, overtly uh, str like overtly strong so therefore kind of like overpowering people uh, overpowering other people there's kind of if you look at the hierarchies in our in our world this is the perfect example of the masculine uh, shadow masculine kind of falling into that ego track 
we have developed sort of power systems whereby people who have more money than us, who have more influence than us, who are born into certain families, who, um, you know, are able to kind of overpower, wield power over others, have shifted themselves into positions of power for themselves, for greed, for success, for, for, again, for power, because power needs power to remain true to itself, right? So in terms of how raising the divine feminine will help the divine masculine this is what i've really been looking at over the last week because i after after speaking in my last show um and i'm sorry about my not being around for the, my, my last week's show i had a load of personal stuff going on children were sick and it was birthdays it was a nightmare um but in terms of over the last week i've been looking at what it is that we really need to begin to do and how it is that we can utilize both energies to be able to raise them both up simultaneously. Because I'm the sort of person that looks at things not as taking them apart and taking away the bad stuff, but really as looking at them as a whole and trying to raise up the good stuff. You know, there will always be shadows within our world. There will always be the duality that we, that we are. There will always be that. So for me, there's no point in trying to just eliminate the dark side, if you like. The dark side is necessary to be able to appreciate and see the light. Um, in fact, uh, one of the phrases that I love to hear is that really darkness is just a place where there is no light or where the light cannot be seen. OK, so it's all it's omnipresent. Both sides are omnipresent, the dark and the light side of everything, that duality. It is the way that we're all made up. It is the way that our world works. There's no escaping it. It's apparent in, in everything. Um, and so I think that really just to be able to kind of bring the good out more is what we need to do. And it will just begin to fade out the dark a little bit. The darkness will always still be there. There will always be parts of our nature, if you like, that strive towards one way or the other no matter how conscious we are no matter how much we try we are human beings we are designed to have faults that we need to then kind of work on overcome journey through you know that's it to my mind the whole point of this life that we each lead and to be able to explore that further within the within the energies that we've been discussing within the masculine and feminine, I think is a real gift. And what it enables you to do is become very, very aware of how you work within your life. OK, so we've discussed the characteristics before. But what I really want to uh, focus on now is how raising up the divine feminine, how by focusing in on the divine feminine inadvertently, raises up the divine masculine and i'm talking about the divine masculine not the shadow masculine not the ego masculine that we're seeing at the moment not that masculine that has kind of built our world repressed and uh overpowered and plowed on through without regard for anybody else the divine masculine is a beautiful beautiful thing and one of the actual conversations that i've been having with my producer actually from this show was how as the divine feminine rises in terms of movements and groups across the earth, um, how that's affecting masculinity across the earth. So his question to me was something along the lines of, if you carry on raising the divine feminine with a ego masculine undertone, which is what we're seeing really in terms of all the overpowering sort of feminist movements um, and the kind of the, the redirect that, you know, actually everything should be uh, turned on its head to be able to rebalance the divine feminine, that everything should be kind of redone, refocused. Where does that leave the real man, if you like? Like when I say the real man, I mean guys living right here, right now in, in this time and right here right now on this earth in this time where does that leave them because you have to remember that what we're asking everybody to do or what i'm asking everybody to do is to stand in their truest self now because of the nature of human beings because of the nature of the experiences the upbringings the belief systems that we have grown up with that we have been um encultured if you like into it's very there's a lot of layers here that need to be peeled back and looked at and re like that need to be kind of realigned. There's a lot. So to think that this is something that will be done overnight 
or that can be done as simply as rectifying this, rectifying that and everything will be OK. Seems a little bit or feels a little bit naive. And the danger, I think, in overpowering the, the ego masculine with what is essentially the ego feminine is that no one's going to win. We're just going to end up in this kind of clashing of heads, this kind of butting of egos, essentially. And no one's going to move forward. It will just create its own sense, again, of kind of, of mistrust, of, um, you know, not getting things right, of overpowering, again, hierarchical systems, those sort of things. You know, it, it's just really turning it from a different angle, but it's the same machine that you're driving. OK, and so this is why I'm really focusing on the positive, the more positive aspects of the divine masculine and the divine feminine energies and how we can really raise them up. And as I said, one of the questions that we were discussing, my producer and I, was where does this leave real man? Because what he was reflecting back to me was that for those men who are conscious, who are awake, who are seeing what's going on in the world and don't align themselves to the hierarchy. They don't align themselves to the um, the overpowering male ego, if you like. They're actually looking at things from a very balanced point of view as individuals. Where does that leave them? Because if the divine feminine is kind of raised up as the ego feminine, if you like, and then kind of, you know, everything turns against real man or the balanced man where does that let then leave them to be able to go forward and explore themselves because essentially you're asking for guilt to become kind of one of the things that they would live with for, for their predecessors for the past life that we've all kind of led and that we've all been brought up with and obviously guilt is a very negative energy and it's a very wasteful energy and neither divine energies align themselves with negativity guilt hate those sorts of things they just they're they're above all that sort of stuff they transcend that they, they don't they can't even lower themselves down as far as that to comprehend and this is why we talk about there being the shadow masculine the shadow feminine and then the divine because the divine really is the goodness the godliness within us all and i believe that we all have that in us i believe that down to the circumstances of our upbringing and our development over the course of our lives certain belief systems, certain manifestations, the way our mind thinks, um, the way it justifies things to try and enable us to continue on, which is essentially what all conscious beings want to do is just to keep living, to keep continuing on. However, we have to balance that out. Our mind will, our mind will do that for us, to make it easier for us, to allow there not to be conflict in a conflict that might damage us emotionally, physically, and you know, all those sorts of things. That's how we work. So, one of the things I kind of wanted to talk about was really the balanced man initially. And the, man, the balanced man or the man who is really working on his divine masculine and standing true in that energy is somebody who has also already embraced the divine feminine. You know, the real, um, the real divine masculine rising within these men deserves to be recognized. And it deserves to be applauded because in all honesty, wouldn't it be easier to stand with the majority, to stand with the successful or the apparent successful, to stand with the apparent powerful? Wouldn't it be easier to align yourself with that rather than take a stand independently or even take a stand over towards the kind of more vulnerable? you know, the divine feminine or the, the shadow feminine, as we're seeing a lot, as we're seeing expressed a lot in throughout the, the world as well, throughout the energies. It would be a lot easier for those men to stand on the side of power, to stand on the side of success, but they just don't resonate with it. And that's something that comes from internal whatever, that comes from spirit, right? That comes from your previous lives, in my opinion, um, and my belief system. It comes from the experiences that you've had in this life. Um, it comes from your soul knowing um, and those sorts of things. You know, when you can stand tall and true within spirit, whether you're male or female, you often take a risk. You often put yourself out there to be very vulnerable. And this is not something that I want to see personally anyway, pushed down and belittled um, and kind of moved out the way in favor of something that is 
tending to be aggressive, tending to be kind of pushy and out there. Um, and so I feel like before we kind of go into raising up the masculine and feminine energies together, I kind of want to give a bit of a high five out there to the ascending man, if you like, the real man who is standing tall for both his internal self and the calling of his internal soul. Um, and the one who's kind of able to stand tall still and say, no, no, do you know what? I don't want to be a part of that. I don't know where I, lo I'm, I am in between this kind of argument, this battle from the ego feminine and the ego masculine, but I'm not aligning myself with either one of those. And of course, it's not just men per se. It's not just the male uh, physique or the male person who's going through this. It's the feminine as well. We are a combination of both the energies. So there are many females who are doing exactly the same thing. And it's really these people that I kind of ask just to remain resolute, remain where you are, remain true to yourself, stand tall, true to yourself, and empower others around you to do exactly that. You don't have to join a movement to get things done. You can be your own light, shine your own light, do what you're doing the best way that you can. And that is enough as well to hold that force sacred and to hold yourself high throughout this changing times, shall we call it. So what something that he reflected back to me, my producer, was that men are becoming afraid to be masculine because of what that is beginning to represent. Because the way the feminine this movement, if you like, the feminist, the feminine movement, however you want to kind of describe it, the way it's moving is through power, which is inherently a masculine, a masculine trait. Right? This is the danger. It's kind of going, it's it's holding up all the, 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 the great qualities of the divine feminine, but it's pushing it forward with the shadow masculine still. It's almost the idea of kind of fighting fire with fire, if you like. We're saying actually we've got another board to hold, but we're still gonna we're still gonna march on the same issue. And I believe that actually what needs to happen is not just a tipping in the balance of scales. It just everything needs to shift. You know, when you talk about a shift, you're not talking about imbalance. You're talking about a cyclic movement. You're talking about, a, you know, a, a circular, a, a cyclical movement. You're talking about something going from one appearance to another. You're not talking about kind of, and no, that's not even the right way of describing it. A shift is something that happens both internally and externally, I believe. When you shift something within yourself, you externally be, be to project that. And that is actually inherently coming from the internal kind of feminine, creative source, um, nurturing source of you, and then externally projecting it as the masculine does. So you're coming from a, an internal feminine position and shifting things around and projecting them out using both energies to be able to do that. And this is how complex, if you like, the two energies moving together are because when they're in their divine state, they are constantly supporting, holding, shifting one another. That is the nature of energy, is it, it's movement, it's constant kind of forward motion, if you like, um, whether it be the creative energy of the feminine, um, you know, you, you can never go back on a birth, for example. You know, it is what it is. It's constantly moving forward. There's constant development. If anything should happen midway, that, that's, a, that's a different thing. But constantly it's developing, moving forward. And then the masculine energy is something that takes that, moves it, projects it outside, takes things from A to B, takes your, you know, uses the logic, uses the action, uses the strength, using the force that it has for truth, for love, for the greater good of all, not for his own gains, not for um, yeah his own his own personal projection, but for the benefit of all. And so to be able to align those two energies together within yourself, this is when the power really begins to happen. Okay, so when we are looking at the divine masculine rising, we are really looking at staying true to who we are. That would be that truth seeking. And when I say who you are, I mean the person that you are inside, not the person that you project on the outside, the person that gets ready and, you know, wears the suit every day or gets up and does the same routine just to get themselves through the day. I mean the person you are inside, that soul person that you are, 
the person who has the creativity, the person who has the love, that part of you that expresses like that. When you are in your more ego state, when the masculine, you may be looking at kind of, you know, holding your position of, of power, holding your position of worth, because essentially you're looking for, you are looking for other people's approval from you. The divine masculine isn't looking for approval. The divine masculine is kind of, to bring it back onto earth, is kind of king-like, you know, is, is actually above all that. It's all about protecting. A good king is looking out for everybody else. He's looking out for his people. He's protecting himself so that he can continue to protect his people. He stands true for he stands for truth. He stands for loyalty. He stands for strength. He stands for protection. He stands for love, essentially, through all of those mediums. Okay, and he also has by his side a queen that has to be able to be as strong as he is. Otherwise, they're not, they're not equal. They're not, they're not the balance that they need to be. And he will take counsel from his queen as she will listen and talk openly to her king. You know, there has to be kind of that level. And that's what you're looking for in yourself to be able to balance the energies as well. You're looking to be able to stand tall for who you are, be loyal and true to who you are. But at the same time, be vulnerable enough to love openly, be vulnerable enough to speak your truth and to talk and to be able to empower people with your wisdom and the wisdom that you found through your own journeys. You know, again, kind of looking within yourself, doing the work, learning. And recognizing where you fall down slightly and you raising yourself up again, you know, recognizing, if you like, where the borders of the land are weak and enforcing them. You know, it, it, it's that sort of thing. OK, so. I'm going to go on with what I was kind of going to start with today, which was something that came to me when I was doing some further research. Um, and this is like sometimes, you know, when you're reading through stuff and you are really engrossed in the subject and you're, you're kind of, you know, you're loving it. I mean, this, like I've said this before on previous shows, this whole research that I've been doing over the past few weeks has not only opened myself, my mind up to myself and who I am and how I work, but it's opened my mind and my eyes, I think, out to every living thing, every living thing. Because every living thing has this energy within it. Everything is dual, you know, has this duality. And so it has this masculine and feminine energy within it. And we can only really explore ourselves, if you like, in that sense. You know, I can't like, you know, I could talk to my dog um, about what he's feeling. But, at, you know, I obviously can't. That would be great. You know, if I could kind of align myself with my dog and how he's feeling. What I can do is transfer my like my attention towards him to be able to read him, to be able to look for the characteristics that I recognize in myself in terms of masculine and feminine energies and look how he demonstrates them. And that's something that I've been doing as a little bit of a side experiment for myself over the last week. Because what came to me when I was doing this research was actually, do you know what? The world itself, our planet, is, is made of energy. We are, it is an energetic source, it resonates, it's, it, it, you know, it is a force of energy. Therefore, it has to be combined with this duality as well. And as I began to go through that in my mind, I began to think, you know what, that's true. It lives, it moves, it wants to remain alive. You know, it's constantly growing, it's constantly developing, but it's strong, it's powerful. You know, it's in control. If you look at the weather, if you look at the natural disasters, we call them disasters. Maybe it's the world trying to just right itself, you know, like there must be reasons for these things. And maybe it's the imbalance in the world that begins to kind of shift some of these things. I don't know. This is one of the things, like I say, that has been playing around in my mind because of kind of a download thing that I had about the, the consciousness of the world and how by raising our own consciousness on this planet, how that will then permeate out into everything that's living on this planet and say so inadvertently raises the conscious level of the planet itself. I don't know. Comment on that. Comment on that. I would love to hear what you guys think. But what I began to think of was like, you know, every conscious being, every conscious living thing inherently has one need, and that is to be alive at any to any extent. 
it will stay alive for as long as it possibly can. And that's on even a cellular level. You know, our, cell, our cells self-destruct whenever they believe that their nature is turning to the point where they will damage the cells surrounding them, where they could kind of cause a malfunction within the body. And so they self-destruct, they commit suicide. That's just our cells in our body. So if we, on a cellular level, are that intelligent, that's an intelligence that will be permeating right out through the plant kingdom, through the animal kingdom. It's a, that's a consciousness that's going to permeate out into our world just by the nature of how we will survive energetically on this plane, in this dimension, on this physical planet. So one of the things that kind of got me thinking about that was, if we begin to make this shift with ourselves, how will that then affect our planet? Like our planet, obviously, in terms of the plant life and the wildlife that we are at the moment in like the sixth mass extinction in the history of our planet that we're aware of and it's come so quick and so fast everything's out of balance it needs to heal but it's unable to heal in the current climate that essentially mankind has produced what i'm kind of thinking is if we begin to shift within ourselves and that shift is great enough that shift will permeate out through to other conscious beings that we share our planet with and eventually will permeate out through and into the world. And then what sort of a shift will that develop for our planet itself? You know, will there be an ability to be able to heal itself? I was watching on um, on one of these kind of little Facebook video things that comes up. I was doing some some um, promoing stuff on Facebook the other day and one of these little videos came up and it was about these caterpillars that can eat through plastic. And I just thought to myself, it's one of those things, this world is so amazing that you can literally ask for something and it will appear. You know, it's literally that magical, this planet. So why not, why not, why not enable that, that idea to grow? Why not believe that if we make a change within ourselves, and that just that small change that we make within ourselves, that we commit to growing, we commit to healing, we commit to uniting the masculine and feminine energies, the divine masculine and feminine energies within ourselves, and we commit to that growth, then all we have to do, all we, we only have to do it for ourselves, we each have to do it for ourselves, and then the, the change and the experiences that we will receive from that will permeate out into the rest of the world. And maybe this whole sense of global healing that we so desperately need on our planet to be able to survive. You know, every day I feel like I'm bombarded with, we talk about how there are fewer and fewer bees, how if we lose our insect population across the world, that, you know, that's going to affect our plant life. Our plant life affects our, our you know, our, our animal life. Animal life obviously affects us all. Um, you know, the quality of the air that we breathe, everything. You know, if things aren't, if, if this beautiful, intricate, codependent system, ecosystem that we live on on this planet gets too damaged, then everybody will be badly affected. And we're already beginning to see that across the world. We're already being able to see that in our water systems, in our environment, in our air systems, where we live, the actual structure of the earth itself, the fine balance between the gases that we experience in this planet. You know, all those sorts of things. So I kind of am thinking if we can start with ourselves and really focus in on this, then we'll be able to expand that consciousness out, that healing consciousness out to the world. And that would be an amazing, amazing thing. I mean, I would love to be able to live through. But listen, if we sow the seeds now, who knows? You know, that's our role. I believe right now we're seeing all this change in our lifetimes because we are the people to be able to raise this up and to be able to give this, uh, give this challenge a name and own it and take it and really be able to develop it and grow and enhance and empower the future generations with further knowledge, with further wisdom, with the strength of our forefathers that enabled us to be able to change. And then we become the forefathers that enable them to be able to continue on the change. Okay, this is why we have this cyclical nature. This is why we continue on life after life, to be able to take the teachings and the learnings forward on through with us and to generally be able to ascend through. 
and everybody's at different levels with this and everybody's got their own journey and there is no rush but I honestly believe that right now the crisis that we're seeing is a challenge for us it is enabling us to take the opportunity or it gives us an opportunity if you like to rise up and to really make a difference and to lay the paving stones if you like for the world that we can live in for the conscious evolution that we can have on this planet so where was i have thrown myself off now masculine and feminine energies so what i wanted to talk about was how when you're bringing up either the masculine the divine masculine or the divine feminine how they utilize within one another everything that i've been reading over the last few weeks has led me to believe that in fact, as I know, I recognize that it's really the divine feminine that needs to grow within all of us, because that is the thing that has been repressed across the board, whether you're male or female, it, it, that's what's been repressed, generally speaking. Maybe not right now in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of shifting going on, but certainly culturally, sociologically, it, you know, the patterns have been in ground for a very long time. And what became really kind of beautifully obvious to me was how by raising up the divine feminine you encourage the divine masculine to become stronger as you do that and vice versa so by raising up the divine masculine you pave the way for the divine feminine to step forward they have to move together this is the point it's no good just tipping the scales and saying okay it's been man's turn for so long now it's the female's turn you know it, it, it that's not going to work that's like you know it's kind of the eye for the eye type thing you know, no one wins, do they? No one wins if everybody's blind. You know, it, it, you have to kind of take a step back and up, in honesty. Take a step back and step up, look objectively at the way that you work, the way that we all work. And we need to come up with a plan or a way of ascending that is going to be able to amalgamate both the energies together and keep the balance, keep the alignment, not tip it from one side to the other in some kind of struggle to be able to, to get forward and, and find out what's fair. It, this isn't about fair, this is about survival. Survival instincts are inherently the masculine instinct, the divine masculine instinct. We need to harness the power of the divine. We need to harness that divine masculine instinct to be able to raise up the feminine and we need to be able to raise up the feminine so that the divine masculine has a purpose has something to be able to protect has a point to be loyal to and all those beautiful beautiful aspects of the divine masculine and so we one without the other is just not gonna work it's just not we're not going to be able to move anywhere we're going to remain stagnant admittedly in a different type of um in a different appearance if you like in a different shape but we will remain stagnant and so with that in mind i wanted to give some ideas of how raising up the divine masculine uh, will be able to empower your divine feminine and vice versa so one of the things that um the divine masculine is very good at is kind of this sense of protection now as a woman one of the I, i'm not a particularly i'm quite an easygoing kind of girl actually i'm kind of quite chilled um not a lot really phases me, if I'm honest. I get quite passionate about things, um, but I don't tend to get particularly angry. It takes quite a lot to really kind of push my buttons until I became a mum. <laughs> and this was kind of the one of the ironies that I discovered when I was doing all the research for this topic was that when I became a mum, I suddenly discovered that I had this kind of protective sort of lioness type side, you know, and I don't really align it with the divine feminine, if I'm honest. Not that the divine feminine isn't strong, not that she's not kind of a warrior and, and will protect her own and all that sort of thing. But for me, this felt a very different side of me. Um, and I've always kind of leaned, I think, more into my divine feminine than my divine masculine. And yet what I've noticed that in the last few years is that I've needed to raise up my divine masculine, that, that divine masculine energy within me to be able to achieve the things that at some stage of my, or one stage of my life, I didn't think would even be open to me. Okay, I was sitting in my shadow self for quite a while not able to believe in myself for a number of reasons predominantly my environment my relationships that i was in um you know feeling undervalued feeling like i wasn't good enough all those sorts of things um 
and it held me back and it was the divine masculine energy within me actually that enabled me to fight for who I am fight for my truth and raise myself up now bearing in mind what I do um, I'm a yoga teacher I'm a life coach um, bearing in mind that for me one of my gifts that I know to share is to serve and I'm very happy to do this I find it personally very very rewarding to be able to help people and to see the empowerment that they get from you know working with me if you like um and, and really how they develop within themselves that's my joy that is my joy when you see you know when when the, it's reflected back to me look how far i've come look how well i'm doing i can't believe this is me three months ago i would never have believed that i've been able to achieve this you know, I didn't ever think that I was ever going to get there. Thank you. You know, all those sorts of things. The fact of the matter is, the work that I do by serving other people is to simply reflect back to them how they can move more fluidly throughout their lives, how they can empower themselves, how they need to practice more self-love. Um, it's very feminine qualities, really, you know, what I do for a living. And yet, to be able to do that and make a living out of it, I had to embrace my masculine energy. I had to, otherwise I was just not going to get anywhere. Sitting around, writing around all day and kind of dreaming, creating, but never really doing was, um, I mean, still is, if I'm honest, is kind of my procrastination. That would be me. I'm always busy. I have a lot of energy. I'm always quite a busy person. Um, but my way of procrastinating would be to be all creative and no action and so inviting or invoking if you like my masculine energy has enabled me to push myself forward and it hasn't been particularly natural thing for me to do although I felt the rewards of it once the rewards have begun to come in initially there's been a lot of kind of putting on the big girl pants if you like you know there's been a lot of me pushing myself out of my comfort zone there has been a lot of me continuing to push myself out of my comfort zone even when I've gone that far and I feel like oh okay I can rest I'm like no because you're not there yet you know you're you're moving from A to B you're at kind of you know I don't know A plus one you know you need to you've got all these little steps that you need to get there that logic that drive that action that focus that's all the masculine and that's what you know I really need to kind of keep working on and keep rising up so that I can continue to be the divine feminine and express the divine feminine to be able to help and to serve because if i can't make money out of what i do then i'm never going to be able to continue we've had a um question come in so i'm just going to read it out is the desire to serve more a feminine or masculine trait my partner always wants to make sure that we are taken care of but is that any different from my desire to make sure that they're okay feels to me that they're both elements to serve Absolutely, they are. They are. Um, and both masculine and feminine energies tend to be about serving. If you think about protecting, that's quite a selfless thing. Again, mm -hmm. that's a servitude. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a way of, yeah, of, of serving, of, of protecting, of looking after. That is a servitude. Same way that to uh, create, to nurture, to home build, all that sort of thing is a feminine um, you know, a feminine trait, a feminine way of serving, if you like. Um, I think that servitude, if you like, comes inherently from love. And that is the all-powerful, if you like. Love is the thing that transcends masculine and feminine. It is the one thing when they come together that they almost produce if you like. And if you think about that in terms of pro procreation, you know, it's, I mean, it's hard to say that in this day and age, isn't it really? But essentially the coming together of a man and a woman to build a whole new person and allow a new soul come, to come through, it should have been, or it should remain still. And it does remain still in many ways, but I, I don't know, like, you know, that's a whole new, that's a whole new subject. But to be able to come together and produce this new person and to allow this new soul to come through is inherently an expression of love. 
it's an and it's a divine love it's it's the gut it's the gap it's the opening it's the doorway through for spirit to pass it has to be love it has to be the most beautiful thing that we can imagine and when you know real love and you have real love in your life you see that really it surpasses any personal need um, any wants any desires it really is just what it is this feeling of kind of elation and joy and wholeness and oneness and fullness and I think that that is where this kind of servitude comes from it, it's the kind of the wanting to express that it's it's a part of expression of love is wanting to help other people and to serve other people and it's definitely rooted in both masculine and feminine because there's no way like the ma the masculine energy is about the truth it's about the protection of others it's about it, in that terms it's servitude and but it, it's for the greater good which is about love real love um and the same thing with with you know the feminine energy with the nurturing with the caring with the creative home you know the building of a of a kind of a whole body inside of yourself that too as well you're giving up the whole time you're serving the whole time and it comes from a place of love of wanting to kind of help of to be there to hold safe to hold secure and not in some kind of weird possessive way when i say hold safe hold secure i mean just to kind of hold that space and it's one of the kindest things that you can do for somebody else is to hold the space to allow them to grow you know you hold a safe space for them you accept them you reflect back honestly to them you know and both of those again we're crossing into the masculine and the feminine it's it's very interesting it's very interesting and i love the fact that you can see in your partner that he's always wanting to take care of and again that's kind of a very masculine way of, of being but it's also the kind of it they want there's the downside to that of the they want to take care of but they want to be taken care of themselves okay that would be more of the ego masculine as well that's not to say that you know they don't ever receive love they don't ever receive and, and take love but it's just um that demand for that attention the demand the want the idea that they are owed it that then begins to move into the shadow masculine the ego masculine you know that whole i deserve i've done this for example, the idea that, you know, you come home, you bring home the bacon, therefore dinner should be on the table. It's like that expectation is the thing that moves the act of going out and serving for your family and protecting and looking after your family. That's what moves it back into the shadow masculine. That idea that once you've done that, you are entitled to something. You know, when you serve for truth and for love, you you expect nothing in return. Um, and actually, it's interesting because that's something that I find, and I know a lot of other people who work in, in you know, my line of work as well, who kind of um, are working in the genre of, of spirituality, if you like. It often becomes quite a big thing about knowing their worth, knowing their value, um, and and being empowered enough within yourself to be able to ask for it and this is what i mean by i've really had to lean into my masculine energy because i have always been that sort of person who's been there for everybody who will listen and who will help and will construct and all those sorts of things for people once i decided that i wanted to do this out in the big wide world if you like and develop a business around it i became very uncomfortable with asking for money for this service you know it felt like this was something that i just naturally wanted to give that i naturally wanted to do um and it, it yeah it really made me feel uncomfortable if i'm honest about um asking for money so that I, it really became a balancing out of logic I again leaned into my masculine energy and it became like you know Kirsty, you're not going to be able to carry on with this if you're not able to support yourself as you do it that's literally the bare fact as weird as that might make me feel because I'm used to sitting in that creative space, you know, and also that kind of, it challenges me. So it made me feel uncomfortable because it challenged, it challenges the way that I love and that I serve. And so, yeah, so for that, in that instance, it really began to become um, uh, something, yeah, something that I really needed to work on and I really needed to focus myself on um, to be able to grow into that and to be able to rise my mm -hmm. masculine energy so that um you know i could 
I could really carry on doing what I love to do that, so that I could carry on expressing that and not just go and <laughs> this is going to sound awful but not just kind of go and get a real job because that was the other option you know and in the end it became almost fear-based the fact that if I didn't if I didn't do what I wanted to do if I didn't push on and grow and do what I felt like I was being called to do then I would have to go and do something that was essentially meaningless in comparison um, and that wasn't something that I was willing to do either. Again, so many times in my life, I feel like I've fallen back into my masculine energy rather than raised it up. And I think this has been quite reflective for me as well over the last few weeks. Um, as I've mentioned before, I was in an, uh, an abusive relationship um, a few years, well, a long time ago, really, 10, 10 12 years ago now. Uh, and one of the things that made me stand up for myself eventually and it was eventually it was after time you know this wasn't something you, I I always believed before I remember seeing an Oprah Winfrey show and she said something like you know mm. you're only a victim when you want to be a victim um and you hold yourself in that victim state you know you keep yourself there no one else you keep yourself there and I always remember thinking yeah that's absolutely right you know like don't let people just treat you like that blah 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 then it happened to me in the conference of love, or apparently, you know, supposed love. Um, and it was my masculine energy was the thing that actually got me up eventually and got me moving out of there. As my feminine energy, sh shadow or divine, was getting pushed down and pushed down and devalued and oppressed and um, destroyed, essentially. You know, that part of me belittled taken down as that was happening to me it had no strength it had no words of wisdom it had no ability to create in fact the only thing that I focused on um because I was pregnant and and uh oh, loads of stuff was going on at the time but um one of the only things that I ended up doing was actually just focusing in on my unborn child as all this stuff was happening um and it wasn't until I think my son had been born and I'd had this kind of, we'd had this really big blow up um, and I'd experienced a lot of violence and I had no more tears left to cry. And I felt like, in fact, looking back, I feel like as I was kind of like laying on the floor, broken, that was my divine feminine lying on the floor, broken. And out of that came this. And this is my divine masculine, that force that went, shoom, you can do this, get up, get out, move, make headway, whatever you've got to do. And I literally moved from being this kind of broken woman on the floor to planning an escape. And it was an escape. I was in another country at the time, planning my escape, executing my escape right from, you know, I mean, awful, really, but, you know, lying to get myself out, booking secret tickets, spending secret money, you know, all these sorts of things that I could have done months and months and months previous. But I had to kind of almost be at that broken stage, I think, to be able to rise. And and I found that a lot in, in life and in my experiences with other people as well. It's like once you're broken, then you can really rise. And that's not to say that that's the only way that you can rise but it sure does give you a good foundation you know it gives you nowhere else to go when you've hit rock bottom and there is nowhere else and you don't even recognize the person that you are then to be able to rise up from that it feels like you almost got a kind of a springboard going on um and so you know being able to kind of lean into that masculine energy suddenly this force that I can, I feel like it must have laid dormant in me. You know, throughout that whole episode, I was looking at my partner at the time, uh, um, a guy, um, as my kind of masculine force. And yet, as he was going further and further into the shadow masculine and losing himself in it, because there were a lot of times where he showed real remorse and regret and upset for everything that was going on and the way he was treating me and, and the way that I was left following our, our arguments and all those sorts of things, as he was losing himself. And I was losing myself. In the end, it became my divine masculine that got me up, got me out and broke me out of that situation. And 
yeah, as I, I never thought about it like that at that time. You know, I, I never did. I remember, and I discussed this a few weeks ago, I remember almost hearing my father's voice, you know, that benevolent father's voice in my mind saying, you know, get up, get out. You're not taking this anymore. You're worth more than this. And I don't know where that voice came from. You know, it sounded like my dad's voice. It sounded like that man, that figure who had always instilled self-esteem and self-confidence and self-value and self-worth within me, you know, had kind of just really just picked me up and, you know, put, picked me up under my arm, stood me up and gone, and now go. You know, now you have to go. I've picked you up. Now you go. And it became all about kind of doing things in the masculine way. When I look back, it was very calculated. Um, it was uh, every step was logical. And there was an opening for me on every way. This is how this is when I really began to believe in the magic and the creation of the universe and how it's on our side the whole time, even if we can't see it right now or right in that time, which I certainly couldn't in that space. Um, you know, you, you, you get the lesson, whether you get it right then in the moment or whether you get it later on um, is really, you know, dependent on how much I think you're looking for it above anything else. Um, but certainly that was one of the things. It became very, very logical. It became very, uh, you know, get me from A to B. It required a lot of strength, both physically, both emotionally. It required me to prioritize my, my child over myself uh, and everything else. Um, and that was kind of, you know, when I look back now, especially over the research that I've done, I feel like I've learned another lesson on how my masculine carried me forward and how strong it is and how necessary it is for me as a woman to have that masculine side. You know, it, if without it, I would have just laid broken, literally, on the floor. You know, I just would have laid there because I had nothing left from the feminine. I had nothing left. Like I said, I'd been belittled. I'd been, you know, aggressive, like aggressively beaten and and manipulated, um, emotionally abused, you know, all those sorts of things, all those sort of things that really hit home to the divine feminine, whether you be man or woman, physically speaking, to hit those parts of the divine feminine will hit everyone. And that's how you know you've got the divine feminine in you, whether you're masculine or feminine, because we all feel, we all hurt, you know, we all recognize um we will recognize that feeling of not being held for their worth, you know, whatever it is inside us. We'd all have had that experience. And I think that is the divine feminine you as well, responding and asking you, you know, to feel uncomfortable so that you can change that, so that you can stand taller for who you are. It's the strength of the masculine that will carry you through. And it's the strength of the masculine that gives you the ability, that kind of that gumption to get up and move forward. So one of the things was to be able to protect. The, one of the uh, divine masculine traits is protection, is being able to protect every, like the people that you love around you, you know, your people, if you take it back to that idea of a king, being able to protect your people, being able to protect your family, those sorts of things. It gives the divine feminine the creative space to be able to birth. It gives the creative space to be able to nurture. You know, if you're thinking about energies and focal, like focal points for energies, if you're constantly protecting yourself and being defensive and all that sort of thing, your focus is outward the whole time. There's nothing going on inwardly. And yet the journey, the most the majority of the journey of your entire life will be done internally. All right. So you have to be able to take that nice balance between the external and the internal when it's needed you project out, whether that be something positive or whether that be to defend. When it's something you know internal, then give yourself that space. Feel safe. Feel protected so that you can give yourself that time. Because you can't do the two things at once. You can't do the inner work while you're busy protecting yourself. You know, it, 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 they counterbalance one another. That's not how they kind of they grow. You're leaning into one, you're leaning into the other. It's so when you bring the two together that you have created a, a safe place for yourself to grow, right? That would be bringing the two together. If you're constantly protecting yourself, being um, defensive, if you like, on the outside, and trying to grow internally, it, it's a conflict of interests. If you have developed and created a safe space for yourself, and then you allow yourself to grow, it's like putting in the best fertilizer, the best soil for your new seedling. It's going to do well. 
because you put the time and the effort in to give it the space and give it the environment that it needs to grow well. Right? And it's a delicate thing. It's a growth. It's, it's, a, it's you know, the beautiful, miraculous part of nature where you can pop this tiny little seed into some like, you know, dark, dark soil and give it a little bit of water, give it a little bit of sunlight, a bit of warmth. And within two, three days, doesn't matter which way you planted that seed, it's found the light. It's found the light. It's pushed up and out. It's cracked open the surface and it's grown and it's pushed up and it's pushed out and it searches for more. And that's the beautiful thing about self-growth. It's constantly looking out and searching for more, constantly looking for that light. We have this demonstrated to us everywhere we look in our natural world. You know, it is the path of life to come from this small thing and to pop out and to grow always towards the light. One of the other um, aspects of the masculine, feminine, uh, masculine, divine masculine energy is to be loyal. And loyalty is something that you can extend towards yourself as well. This is why I say when you stand true in yourself, when you stand tall as who you are, that's you being loyal to yourself. That's not you trying to kind of manipulate yourself to fit in or manipulate yourself to become something that you think will be more easily accepted. Um, or to fit the paradigm that you are being coerced into believing is right for you. You know, that inner truth, that inner knowledge, that's, that's, that self-belief, that self-truth is what you need to be loyal to in, like, from the very beginning. And we're not taught to do this. You know, we're not taught to do this at all. And yet it's in there. It's strong. My son's been having um, some kind of problems at school. Uh, just. At the moment, like a nothing serious, I'm not too worried. But, you know, teething problems. He's in secondary school. He's about to go into year nine. Um, he is one of the youngest in his year. In England, they take the school year from September through to August. So the oldest kids would have been born in September, the youngest in sort of July, August. And my son's a July baby. Um, and he has found himself recently because of his kind of height, uh, because of his build, because of his age, essentially, you know, that he is beginning as puberty kicks in, that beautiful thing, puberty, as that kicks in uh, and everything begins to change and it's physical changes and it's emotional changes and, you know, height, growth, all those sort of things begin to kick in. He has found that he has become kind of one of the kind of the smallest, the youngest looking um, kids in, in his year. And of course, as everybody else is beginning to kind of grow muscles and, you know, voices are beginning to crack. Um, and he's looking at his peers. He's looking at, obviously, he's looking at the other boys in his, his year rather than comparing himself to the, himself to the girls um, for obvious reasons, I should imagine. <laughs> Once that sort of has begun to kick in, there begins to become kind of a little bit of a, a nervousness, uh, an anxiety around, you know, this will this happen for, for me? And he's been beginning to kind of get a little bit like the hierarchy coming in. People are beginning to take a little bit, um, a little bit of control with him. Um, stuff like, you know, knocking drinks out of his hand, taking, you know, swiping his legs out from under him, all those sorts of things. And he, my son, is an empath. And obviously, being my son, <laughs> he has been brought up to um, really believe in himself as an individual and as a soul and as a spirit. Um, and I've always tried to empower all my children in that sense. I've always tried to bring out the characteristics that I see that are inherently theirs. Um, I allow them to be exactly who they are um, as they develop and as they grow. Um, and I try not to coerce them into anything that they don't feel ready for or they're not ready to express or any of those sorts of things. So that's kind of just very briefly my parenting style. And what it's meant that when these boys have been challenging him, he has wanted to kind of laugh it off, brush it off, um, you know, bring the balance back in a bit. He doesn't want to feel imbalanced, but he doesn't want to go down their path of exerting physical power. He wants to kind of just be able to bring it back in a nice kind of, I suppose, feminine way, if you like, in, in terms of the energies. He wants to be able to bring it back into harmony. He wants to be able to heal it all you know, rather than kind of go one way or the other. And yet he was getting more and more frustrated with this was happening. And we had a couple of instances he was coming home and he was sort of saying to me, you know, mum, like, 
you know, it makes me so angry. Like, I don't like it. I don't want to feel like this. Why is it always on me? You know, what all these sorts of things. And I said to him, you know what, Nate? As much as you're not going to kind of like this, I think it might be time to stand up for yourself. You know, I think you've tried it one way. You've tried it the way you want it to be. You've tried sort of smoothing it over and laughing it off and, you know, kind of just healing um, and, and going through it that way. And I think now might be the time to sort of step more into your masculine energy and to kind of stand up for yourself and be true to who you are and to protect yourself. You know, like you're not the aggressor here. They are. You don't deserve to be downtrodden or belittled or uh, any of those things or have power over, you know, over wield you. Um, and this was something that he hadn't really heard me say before, because as much as I am, you know, I'm very much about kind of being able to harmonize things. And certainly within the household, you know, I've got three children, um, the dynamics of myself and my husband, we've got a big dog, you know, it, there was a lot of kind of harmonizing going on so that we can all manage to live together. Um, without too much kind of conflict and argument and all the things that happen within a family. So I'm kind of all about the kind of harmonizing, the understanding, the holding space for. But there does come a time, which I learned when he was a tiny little baby, um, that there does come a time when you have to stand up for yourself. And when I gave him permission, it, it seemed like, to be able to kind of stand up for himself, something changed within him. And he really felt empowered within himself to be able to go forward and make the changes that he felt he needed to make to be able to command the respect that he knew he deserved within his peer group. He didn't want to be particularly aggressive. He didn't want to start a fight. We had a big discussion about it. He didn't want to go and start a fight. He didn't want to go and do back to them what they'd done. He just wanted to give them just a little bit of a taste of their own medicine just to kind of bring it back into what he felt would be like a balance. So he had this kind of talk and, and uh, you know, a couple of his mates were really, really sweet. And they were like, look, Nate, you know, whatever, you want to stand up for yourself. We've got your back, which I thought was lovely. And actually, you know, it was really nice to see them uh, standing together as divine masculines. You know, these, these three young lads, um, you know, and my son being vulnerable enough to say, you know, this is upsetting me. I'm, I'm actually getting bothered by this now. It started off as a bit of a joke, but now it's gone too far and it's upsetting me. And, and, and them to turn around and go, yeah, we've seen it. And we've got you on this. You know, we've got you. We're here for you. We're holding this space for you. You know, it was actually a really, really lovely thing to see and to hear done. Um, and so my son went into school one day with the idea that, OK, if this guy or these guys were going to uh, were going to try and overpower him, he was going to kind of you know teach them something. And what happened was that they overpowered him again. And as he got up to kind of put his plan into execution, he found that what his mind wanted him to do, his body didn't want to do. This was exactly how he explained it to me. He said, you know, mummy said, I had it all in my mind. I knew what I was going to do, but my body just didn't want to do it. I just didn't want to go there. It just didn't want to, it just didn't want to attack back. And I said to him, you know, I said, and he got super, super frustrated. He ended up, um, the, the, you know, the story goes, he ended up really getting upset in school and ended up going to the office and kind of pouring his heart out to the teachers there who uh, were absolutely fabulous, to be fair, um, and talked him through it and discussed it with me over the phone um, and came up with a plan. They were pretty confident that these lads were really just flexing their muscles. You know, they they were nice guys. They thought a lot of Nath. He's well respected, apparently, throughout the whole of his years. So that was nice to hear as well. Um, and that he's well liked and, and that he, the, the teacher that spoke to me, thought that he'd be genuinely upset if they thought that they'd, you know, really upset him. Um, and it ended up with um, him coming back one day and they had made a full apology, these boys, and ever since it's been fine. But what was interesting to me was that his mind was saying to him, you know, go on, Nath, just hit back, just do back, just go back, whatever. But his soul remained the empath. And I didn't really reflect this back to him because when we were discussing it, it really wasn't the right sort of time to be coming to do that. But he has always been, my son, this kind of old soul, empath who's able to relate to older, younger people, who's able to understand things that belie his years. Um, and it was very, very interesting to me that that 
part of him that has always expressed himself or it was expressed itself since he was a baby was really is really still so strong in him irrespective that it just didn't want to take him down to that level it believed still in my mind this is how i read it it believed still that there was another way rather than the whole eye for an eye thing it believed that there was another way and it held true to that and what i did say to him was that you know you have always always held yourself high you have always proven to me to be a wonderful soul and somebody who is caring and who is loving and who is funny and articulate and who um you know enjoys to be part of your team enjoys to be a team player um as well as kind of you know pushing yourself to your own limits and, and getting out there and doing that sort of thing but it's that expression of soul from such a young person if you like that really caught me and surprised me and I just felt like you know there it is that's that divine energy right there because irrespective of what your mind which is essentially kind of you know influenced by your ego um and you've kind of got you know your subconscious self always trying to kind of turn things around so that you don't feel pain and you don't feel hurt and it rationalizes things and all those sorts of stuff but we know about how our mind works how our body works that enables us to have this crazy life experience that we have and yet still when it comes down to it the soul and the spirit really are governing the the most animal i don't want to say animalistic but you know the kind of the most base level reactions that we have and that was really kind of quite yeah quite an eye-opener for me i really felt like i'd learned something through this about Nathan, about my son as well like not just about the situation but about how strong that soul purpose that soul urge that soul self really is you know i felt it within me but it's come for me from a, a much later time um you know i didn't have a lot of this stuff growing up i had a different ways of expressing myself different tendencies um i you know always felt very energetically connected to the world um we used to spend a lot of time out in nature when i was younger and always kind of delving into that and recognizing that i was a part of that but i would never say that i had this whole thing whereby my soul disallowed me to do something that my mind really wanted to do um, and I feel that that was kind of, again, the divine masculine, like rising up within my son and, in, and enabling him, empowering him to be loyal to exactly who he is. And this kind of touches back, if you like, that, that I start talking about the beginning of our, of our class, but how the men and the women who are standing tall and between, you know, standing true to themselves saying actually I don't align with the shadow masculine and I don't really align with this kind of feminist movement that's saying that you know we should be kind of raising up the feminine to overpower the masculine this is exactly where I kind of I feel the power actually is you know stay true to yourself stick with your soul purpose if you're not sure what that is but you have any sort of urges towards a certain thing or a certain way of expression then hold yourself true to that be loyal to yourself it's a way of empowering your masculine energy. It's a way of empowering yourself. It's a way of delving into self-exploration and self-development. Um, and it is a way of being able to hold the feminine aspects of you high at the same time. So being loyal to yourself is not just being loyal to your masculine self. It's being loyal to, the, to everything that you are, to your creative self, to your loving self, to your nurturing self, to your strong, uh, abundant seeking self. Uh, you know, it's all of those, all of those things and more that when you're being loyal to yourself, you're being true to yourself, when you're fighting that good fight for yourself, that's the fight that's worthwhile. And that loyalty is so very important to yourself. You know, you're the only one that goes through your life. You're the only one that has all these experiences. You know, you're the only one that will ever see it the way you do. So even if you spend every second of every day with somebody else, which, you know, none of us really do, because you can't, people can't be with you in your dream state. They can't go through your dreams, which we know affect our, our waking reality. You know, you can't have that experience for somebody else. Life has to be lived by the person living it, not by anybody else. Um, and, it, you know, it, it just belittles the whole point of us being here. Um, so if you are being loyal and true to yourself, then you're not just raising up 
the masculine energy you're not just utilizing that masculine energy but you're also raising up the feminine at the same time and this is how complex and intricate and yet how very very simple these two energies are when they move together when they unite as one one of the other um traits of the divine masculine is their strength and it's not just strength on the external not just kind of muscular physical strength although obviously when you look at that you know a man or you know uh, a, a the personification of the male energy if you like you can see that they're physically much more um, able than the majority of women um, and that they are built for strength you know like i will never have the upper arm strength that my husband's got it doesn't matter how many handstands i do it doesn't matter it doesn't you know i would just i i'm just not built like that and it, it, that's not really a vulnerability to me so much as kind of an annoyance <laughs> but what I kind of am getting to with this is that strength is not simply external. Strength is also internal. You know, it's the strength internal to yourself that allows you self-control, for example, that allows you to fight the good fights, you know, to pick your battles. It's that ability to be able to control your emotions. It's that ability and that strength inside you that picks you up when you've been knocked down and dusts yourself off and carries you on. You know, those sorts of things. That is the divine masculine rising within. But it holds space. It holds a sacred space for the divine feminine to be able to move as well because she needs to be strong in her love. She needs to be um, internally very powerful if you like to be able to help and to serve and to heal you know that energy that she's going to then give out to other people when she heals the divine feminine within us all needs to be embraced and held strong by the divine masculine at the same time otherwise you'd just be completely depleted but that strength that ability also from the divine masculine to be able to move past or through or over however it needs to obstacles the things that come up us in life Again, it's that picking yourself up, dusting yourself and getting on with it. And we all do it. Excuse me. We all need to kind of be able to recognize that as well um, and be able to kind of stand tall in our own strength, our external strength and our internal strength. And I think internal strength is one of the things that we kind of really need to be leaning on now because to stand tall and to be loyal, to be strong, these are all masculine traits that will help us raise up the divine feminine, which is asking us to nurture, which is asking us to heal, which is asking us to be creative with our thoughts, you know, not to be linear, not to be seeking through to power, to greed, to uh, ownership, um, but actually to be seeking through community to be seeking through a, a sense of togetherness um, and to be empowering ourselves in that aspect, which is very inherently the divine feminine. So be able to get that mix, to be able to bring it all together. You must be able to use both the divine and the feminine to support one another as we go through. In yoga, we talk about the, the nadis, which are the energy paths that run down kind of, um, you know, and they cross across all the way down the spine. Um, they cross and they come out like out through the nostrils. And one of the things that I wanted to share was how we begin to, uh, in, in yoga, through, through pranayama, through yogic breathing, uh, prana is, is the word for energy or force, life force. Um, and um, yama is the restraint of it, the, 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 the control of it. So pranayama is the restraint or control of the breath, the inherent force that keeps movement going in our body that brings um, the necessary things that we need to survive on, on a, you know, on a secondary, on a second by second basis in and out of our lives. So it's, it's all about movement. It's all about force. Um, and it's about kind of, you know, being able to breathe in and control that energy and utilize it to be able to harness and heal. So one of the things that we do in yoga to be able to rebalance that energy and something that you guys can try at home if you're feeling like actually you need to recenter, to reground, to kind of bring it all back in and focus in on, on working the left and the right into unison is, um, is, is a, a form of pranayama that involves kind of alternate nostril breathing and single nostril breathing. So it's very, very easy. Um, you can do it kind of pretty much wherever you are in fact um, you just need your hand um, and you need your nose and that's about it and what we're going to start off with is just clearing out both nostrils so clearing out as I said before the left brain is the logical side the kind of the mathematical the masculine 
side, if you like. The right side of the brain is the more creative, um, nurturing, caring side of the brain. We, we know this. And what happens is when you attach the principle of the nadis or the energy force to it, this begins to cross. So this will cross at the third eye, move down, and inherently just go down through your spine, like traveling down through your body, through your energetic self um, as well, like that. And so what we can do when it crosses over at this point here, which is the nose and the third eye point, is begin to control from this source. So whenever you're focusing in on doing any pranayama or breathing work, really focusing on the sensations that you feel here, okay? Not just concentrating on what you're doing, but also focusing in on this center here, where the nadis cross, where the masculine and the feminine, you know, that kind of magical connection of energies there. So initially what we're going to be doing um, is holding our hands into what we call in, in um, yoga a mudra, which is cutting, uh, tucking down the, the middle two fingers, having the thumb open and having the first two fingers open. I always find this really hard. Um, so I often would tuck down that third finger and just use my, my little finger. But, you know, as you, however you find comfortable, really the mudra is, is the least of, of the practice. Um, and what we're going to start with is opening up our right nostril. So your right, um, as you're looking at me, will be your left. My right would be this side, right? So we're opening up the right side. We always start with the right side because it's the physical side. And when we're working on ourselves, we work on the physical, uh, and then we move into the kind of the internal, the emotional, okay? This is the same, in, ironically, this is the same in reflexology. This is one of the reasons that I've developed the systems that I have within my working practice, whereby I encourage and facilitate my clients to be able to work on their physical selves at the same time as getting involved with their kind of their mental their emotional or psychical emotional selves as well because it feels like when you begin to engage all three parts together usually you're you're firing off on your psychical self and your emotional self that's all going strong what we've what we've stopped doing predominantly speaking across the, across certainly the western world anyway is we've stopped connecting in with our physical self um, and it's it's a huge loss. And once you begin to bring them all back into balance, that's when you begin to notice the subtle messages of the journey that you're on. And so this is one of the practices and this is one of the um, one of the things that I've learned over my life um, that have enabled me to empower myself to recognize the connection between all the parts of self and to be able to devise the system that I now work through with my clients. So one of the things that we'll do is pranayama, this um, alternate nostril breathing. So we're going to start with the right hand side because we're starting with our physical self. We're starting also with our logical self. It allows the brain to kind of um, start on a pathway that it's familiar with, that it knows that we it knows we'll get it somewhere as well. So again, we're training in that right side there. Yeah, right, left side of the brain by starting on the right nostril okay so we're going to close with the little finger we're going to close our left nostril off my voice probably will go a little bit funny as i do this but as we cross cross off our left nostril we're going to take a deep breath in through the right nostril and it needs to be a calm collected breath but i want it to be as deep as you can we have three parts to our lungs one two three Right? We tend to breathe into the middle part only. We tend not to breathe into the top part of our lungs or the lower part of our lungs that leads down to our diaphragm. So in yogic breathing, it's about engaging all three parts of your lungs and filling them um, and stretching them and enabling them to take on and breathe in as much oxygen, as much life force, as much movement, as much of all of that as we possibly can through each breath. So as you breathe in initially, again, as like I say, I want you to kind of concentrate on that area as you feel the breath coming in and up towards the crown of your nose and, and the third eye point here, the Agnes chakra, the chakra point, the brow chakra. But then I want you to recognize how you breathe and you want to be breathing into the center of your chest and then the lower part of your chest and bringing it up into the higher part of your chest. OK, that's kind of the, the movement that you want, which is kind of raising it up. So you'll breathe easily into the middle part of your chest, then bring it down so that your lower belly is more extended as it opens up through the lung. The diaphragm drops down, enables plenty of space around all your internal organs. And then that third part of the breath is really coming up into the top, up to almost underneath the collarbone where the, the lungs actually begin to kind of hit the top and that's it they're not going to go any further so as you breathe in through that uh, right nostril remember to breathe into the center part then expand the stomach at the bottom then expand the chest at the top 
And then after that, you can breathe out of that right nostril. We're keeping that left nostril closed for the whole time. And what I want you to try and do, we're just going to do a couple of those breaths now. If you can just carry on as I'm talking, just breathing in deeply in through the right nostril, engaging all three parts of your lung, holding for a second, and then beginning a slow breath out. And what I want you to become aware of now that you've done a couple of those breaths is how long you're breathing in for and how long you're breathing out for. And what you'll notice also when you're breathing in and out is that there are actually four parts to our breath. We don't just inhale and exhale. We inhale, we hold the breath. We exhale, we hold the breath out. Okay, so just as you keep practicing, just remember that. Okay, so we're blocking off the left nostril, engaging the left side of the brain, the right, the right nostril, the um, we're talking about the logical parts, so our masculine energy that we're working now. If you feel any blockages in that right nostril, if you feel like actually the breath is hard to breathe in through kind of anything that kind of might be um, vascular through your nose, you know, you, or it, you feel like something's catching in your throat, maybe you feel like actually breathing in through that nostril, you don't feel like you can expand your lungs as much as you'd expect to be able to, then that would reflect back to me that you have a, an imbalance in the masculine energy that there's something there blockages and things like that tend to be kind of stuff that's asking to be looked at and it might be that you're leaning too heavily into your masculine energy for work um that you are not uh it, not in balance in that sense one way or another and often when you move then onto the feminine side onto the left nostril doing the same thing so again once you've done five or six breaths on that left on that right side take to take deep breath in holding for a moment breathing out holding out for a moment try and make it to like four you know four or five as you breathe into you're breathing in for the count of one two three four you're holding for a second and then you're breathing out again for one two three four and holding out for another second and then start again okay do five breaths like that and then we're going to change on to the other side so we're changing now working on the feminine the divine feminine side which is coming from our right brain out through our left nostril so then you're going to change the hand change the mudra change the, the the finger that you're using to block your nose and you're going to push against the right side of your nose with your thumb just enabling it to be blocked off completely same principle here take a deep breath in through the left side it's connecting to the right brain. So that's the creative side, the nurturing side, the healing side. Um, and really begin to do the same sort of thing. Begin to take the breath up towards the third eye, up towards that crux, that point where the nadis cross, the energy paths cross. And then follow the path of the breath down and into your lung. And again, notice things like tightness in the lung, like uh, tightness if you feel any muscular tightness across the chest or the back. Um, they can be indicative of imbalances within the feminine energy as well. Uh, the strength that you breathe in with. Um, a lot of my clients, when we begin to work on this, they sort of think, you know, God, you know, my left side's really not very strong. Like, I feel like I, I'm struggling to get to that last point with my breath. I'm, I, I, you know, I don't feel like I'm really filling up as much as I did on the other side. Interesting just to note down all of these reflections um, back on, you know, on for yourself so that you can begin to notice a change as you continue practicing. And I do recommend that you do this to be able to touch base with how you're feeling and any imbalances that you've got. Um, so again, when we've closed off the right nostril, we're breathing sort of five, six times in through the left nostril. And it's breathing in for the count of four, holding for a second, breathing out for the count of four, holding out for a second, and then repeating. Then once you've done that on both sides, we can then transfer to alternate nostril breathing. And again, we start with the right side so we're covering the left with our finger covering that left nostril with our finger and what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep breath in through the right side again for the count of four then we're going to hold the breath in press down on that right side release the left and then breathe out of that left side again for the count of four then we're going to breathe in through that left side drawing the energy in and up through that left that left nostril and then close off the left and open the right to be able to breathe out so of course as you're moving over you're holding that breath and then you begin to breathe out again and again watch this part here watch the capacity of your lungs watch the feeling around your chest uh, especially feeling uh, feelings across the back and across the front of the chest around the heart area as you breathe deeply in um, do note down how you feel whether you feel that you could perhaps extend a little bit more those sorts of things note down anything that's coming up for you 
Um, and that's one way of being able to kind of adjust and rebalance yourself. So you can continue that on again for like five rounds. So a round would be um, in the right nostril, close the right nostril, open the left, breathe out, in the left nostril, close the left nostril, breathe out the right. That would be one round. So every time you breathe in on the right side, you are starting a new round. Okay, so do five, six initially, just to start that off and feel any differences. And then at the end, I want you to just drop your hand down, take a deep breath in through both nostrils and feel how that feels to have kind of cleared that pathway. Initially, whenever you start doing any kind of pranayama, it's kind of handy sometimes to have a tissue around. You know, we're not used to dealing with like breathing heavily or deeply in and out through our nose. It tends to be more of an involuntary reflex to breathe in and out through the nose. Um, but it's certainly something, you know, if you want to go along and clear your nose as you go along, that's a, that's a nice idea. Um, if you're doing this first thing in the, in the morning, it's a lovely thing to be able to have a neti pot with some nice warm, salty water and just to gently pour through, clear the nasal passages before you start. And then you're really going to kind of get an idea of what is energetic and what is kind of physical matter, if you like, you know, because the physical matter would have been washed out by the water from the neti pot. A neti pot, if you don't know, um, is kind of just a, um, a little kind of it's like a little watering can that's been developed to sort of plug into one side of the nose. And we've got a cavity in the middle part of the nose here. What the neti pot does is it gently pours down saline water, warm saline water through the nostril. It drops down into the other nostril and drops out the other side. And it clears the whole passageway here. So you would do it on one side and then you would do it on the other. Um, and then usually, you know, you have to kind of clear that, clean out both nostrils. But what it really does is begin to remove any dirt, remove any mucus. It's a great way of being able to clear out the sinuses if you've had a cold, anything like that. And just to be able to cleanse them all as well. The salt and the saline um, provides kind of like a, an antibacterial, a natural way of, of cleaning out and removing bacteria. And also gives a little bit of weight to the water so that it moves on any heavier debris. Um, and that's a really lovely way of being able to kind of touch base with yourself and feel, recognize and be able to reflect back on, on any imbalances that you, you, you notice once you, once you start breathing and using your energy, your actual energy as a source of being able to manipulate and adjust the masculine and feminine within you. And always good when you're doing anything like this to just sit afterwards and receive any messages that you that you know that you've, you've laid the path for. Okay, so after any kind of kriya or cleansing or pranayama, I would always sit and, and meditate and just really bring my focus back in on my breath, taking the deep breaths again, yogic breathing nicely into the chest, then calming it down to be a natural state breathing where you are just breathing in calmly, quietly. Um, and, and really beginning to lose the sense of the breath in that natural rhythm of self, which is what it eternally ends up being. Um, just before I kind of move on, I've, I've got a video that I'm, um, I'm going to share with you guys later, because as we've been talking about this divine feminine and divine masculine, some really crazy astrological universal things have been coming up. Um, and I don't know, I've reflected a few things back, but... Beginning of this week, I got um, a email come through from um, a group that I'm part of, uh, numerologist.com. Uh, I have begun to see so many significances and synchronicities with numerology in my life, with astrology in my life. And one of the reasons that I love numerologist numerologist.com is because it combines both astrology and numerology to give you an idea of kind of how the universe is laid out for you throughout your life you know what what some of the synchronicities might mean um what some of the numbers mean there's no there seems to be no as much as there is a randomness in numbers there's so many kind of patterns in the universe that it feels like it's not random you know maybe that well, I mean, can you have a random pattern you know it is that sort of thing um and one of the things that I love about numerology and astrology combined is that the the astrology leans so heavily into numbers you know, things are at certain degrees, like 20 degrees and, and 15 degrees, you know, Pluto's coming at 10 degrees in Cancer, and you know, all these sorts of things. I don't really know, if I'm honest, what all those sorts of things mean, but there is a very obvious and very definite link between um, numbers and astrology. And um, something that came through to me at the beginning of the week while I was researching this and just reading through some of the stuff that I'd been sent um, as I'd reached out for guidance um, was this video that I'm going to be sharing with you. And the reason it felt special to me is because what I'm essentially encouraging 
everyone to do who's watching this is to dip more into your feminine energy and to enable your masculine to rise alongside because it's the feminine energy that's been repressed that's been told that it's not good enough that has been asked to be quiet that has been persecuted over the years um, that has been belittled and hunted and um, stripped bare and that feminine energy is within each one of us I believe in past lives. I have had lots of regression um, it, throughout my life, like from a very young age, regressional memories, regressional therapies, um, visions that have come to me in certain situations that I know to be my past life experiences. And one of the things that I have taken from that is that I have been both a man and a woman in my previous lives. And I don't know why I've chosen whatever dynamic I've chosen for this particular life or the, the lives before me. I don't know why I've chosen that from soul point of view, um, but it's obviously something that I've needed to experience. Having, ha having done all the research that I've done and recognizing that we as both male or female or however we choose to carry ourselves through this journey that we're on right now, the fact that we have these two energies within us and the fact that we are so reliant on the duality within ourselves, within life, within the world around us. I feel like, again, there's no point pushing one down. We need to rise both of them up. We need to bring both of them up. And as I look more and more into it, I see that without the strength of the divine masculine that we've been talking about, the divine feminine won't be able to move up. She needs to be held strong. She needs to be held true. She needs that loyalty. She needs all of those things. You know, it needs to be an inherent moving of both the energies rising rather than just one. And I think one of the things that kind of comes through to me from almost my divine feminine side, this connection with my universe, with the connection with how very, very small I am in comparison and yet how at one and whole and all encompassed I feel when I recognize myself as part of this universe and that's a beautiful thing and that's something definitely that is much more feminine than masculine and I think one of the first times that I ever kind of touched on that reality was when I, I you know gave birth and I felt this real um, uh, a real oneness with every other mother animal, species, anything on the earth. Because like I say, I suddenly got this kind of real force of um, power, this kind of warrior-like woman um, was coming out of me. And it's the amalgamation of both the energies, you know, that nurturing, that healing, that mother energy that is the divine feminine, alongside the strength, the protection, the loyalty, um, you know, the, the, the directness, the focus, the action of the divine masculine. Um, and when I recognized that as kind of a mothering instinct stroke oneness at once with the world, it became very much, uh, you know, it was very spiritual experience. You know, giving birth for me all three times was a very spiritual experience for very, very different reasons. Um, each one was completely unique. There wasn't a single thing that was similar in any of them. Um, and so each one was actually a proper journey it felt like not just for me, but for my child as well. And we, we, you know, we, we've, we've kind of moved on. I've moved, moved on now. Um, and, and yet still things are being reflected back to me. And this is where kind of the astrology and the numerology has always played such a big part in my life. Um, because I recognize things as being certain, you know, good luck symbols, things like that. My son, for example, um, growing up, I had a very good dear friend uh, who was born on the 22nd of June. And my son wasn't conceived. He wasn't. He wasn't planned for. Let's say it like that. Um, I was. I was taking the pill at the time. Uh, I'd been taking the same pill for like nine years, the contraceptive pill, and suddenly there I was pregnant with no real reason or you know as to why. That's why I called him Nathan, which means gift of God in Hebrew, because I just didn't know where this pregnancy had come from. In all honesty, so that's that's one part of my own story. I've been sharing a lot tonight. Um, but he was due to be born on the 22nd of June, which was my dear friend's birthday before he died. Um, and as soon as the doctor gave me that date, I felt it was a sign. It immediately was like, well, that's Kirk's birthday. It was straight away. And I felt like it was 
the first sign of very many that I got throughout my pregnancy through dates and uh, synchronicities um, that enabled me to feel like the decision that I'd made to have him because there was a time uh, when I I wondered whether I should you know because of the relationship that I was in because of I was traveling at the time um, through South America um, I was in Colombia at the time and I you know, unable to really kind of put down really firm roots there without staying in the situation that I was in even though I kind of wanted to stay there and I loved it and I, I'd really found like a, a second home out there um, it, it, there was so much uncertainty in my life but these little synchronicities these little signs became my guides and they became the power that uh, that really enabled me to make the decision and stand by it and there were lots of these little things my son ended up being born on the 4th of July which is Independence Day um, and again kind of aligned me with the Americas aligned him with this breaking free of everything that had kind of come before him uh, enabled me to break through um, away from the relationship to be able to have him all these sorts of things were very very um, symbolistic to me um, and gave me very strong messages and so I've continued that trend of looking into numbers and looking into kind of the astrology of it all all my children are cancer for example which is a cardinal sign um, and it's all three of them are born within three weeks of one another uh, my lucky numbers are three and five um, the fact that they're all born within three three month, three weeks of each other um, I have three children um, you know all these little things all these just all these little things just again sort of come back to being like make me feel very comfortable on the choices that I'm on the path that I'm in and the life that I'm leading make me feel like you know what I've got this I'm held I'm held to do whatever it is that I want to do this Friday there is a new moon in Cancer. There is a partial solar eclipse and it's Friday the 13th. And 13 aligns itself, the number aligns itself with the moon because there are 13 lunar cycles throughout our year. Um, and because, what was the 13? There was another thing, 13. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Now I've lost my bit of paper. Friday amplifies. Okay, so the... Um, so happens on the 13th associated with the moon uh, because we have 13 moon cycles in a year, 13 weeks in a season. And of course, seasons relate to the cycles, um, not only of the moon, but just cyclic, which is something that as a woman, you, you know, you face from the minute you become able to, to carry children right up and through to the woman. It's kind of like that movement from uh, what made to mother, mother to crone. You know, I feel like our menstrual cycle really begins to determine that for you. You're a maid up until you are able to have children. You're a mother up until you're unable to have children. And then you're, you're kind of the crone, if you like. Um, and I've spoken before about how actually, you know, once you think about your life in those sort of cycles, it can give you quite, if, if you don't look at it aesthetically, you know, the word crone isn't a particularly it doesn't drum up this, you know, kind of beautiful woman, like in my mind, it, it's one of these kind of like old, um, you know, I don't know, one eyed things that come out of Hamlet or, you know, or some Shakespeare, you know, like in, in a cave, you know, that sort of thing. That to me is a crone, you know, um, but actually the connotations being crone, that wisdom, that sense of being able to impart gifts and help and nurture still and hold space for those other women that are coming behind you to grow and to bring their children up there and that sort of thing. That's that part of the, the older woman, the part of the cycle that I'm, I, you know, I really love. And I feel it's such a shame that we, uh, as women, are feeling so pressured that we're constantly looking for this constant fountain of youth. Um, you know, that, that, but that's something we've discussed before. Anyway, the video that I'm going to be sharing with you shortly is um, from numerologist.com and it's a lady called Tanya Gabrielle talking about the association between the moon, the universe, like how the other planets and stuff are all kind of all aligning, partial eclipses and what eclipses mean to us in terms of, this is going to be thir the first partial eclipse or eclipse within the next three months, which is really quite rare. Usually they become twos. So again, to have a three, you know, again, there's that number coming up for me. You know, for me, it's like, oh my God, that's three, you know. And over the next three months, from July, August, September, I personally am going through a big period of change in my life. 
Um, and it's something that I'm really, really excited to do. And it's going to require me putting a lot of things on hold so that I give my space, myself space to be able to change and to be able to grow. Um, it's putting into my future. It's enabling me to put into my family and to spend more time with them. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of personal growth coming up in the next three months for me. So to have these eclipses um, empower me in that state as well really feels like the universe again has got my back and this is why i draw on numerology and this is why i look for the synchronicities and the signs and astrology and numerology and combined how they begin to empower me and how they begin to uh allow me to trust even more my journey than i kind of than i i'm beginning to learn already you know take it's taken me quite a long time to get to really recognize and in, and believe in and just have faith in my journey as it happens, as it unravels. Um, these little things, you know, these little kind of drop-ins always empower me and always enable me in that sense. And it's her speciality. You know, the, the people on numer numerologist.com are, the ladies who share, are brilliant. In, you know, I love the way they communicate. I love the way they are. Um, and I really hope that you kind of can understand and, and follow along alongside all this stuff. She's very good at explaining, so I'm sure you will be able to. But it just struck me as well. We're talking about rising up the divine feminine and the divine masculine simultaneously and really working on the divine feminine because that's the one that's been injured. That's the one that needs the healing. That's the one that needs to be held and um, given space and given strength and protection to be able to grow. On Friday the 13th, which is a new moon, moon, very like, you know, synchronous or syn yeah, syn synchronous with the with the feminine, divine feminine on the 13th, which is again, um, you know, very, very aligns itself very, very beautifully with the moon. And of course, then the divine feminine in the first of three solar eclipses and solar eclipses are all about um, empowerment and change and. Um, new foundations uh, they, they sort of amplify your your energy your zest your ability to recover your refueling you know that sort of thing um and there what was the other thing that i was thinking is brilliant for this last month we had a new moon on the 13th as well ah this is it so last month then I look back through my calendar and I realized that it was last month that I started talking about the divine masculine feminine. So for me, this is really beginning to become a culmination of a journey as well. As I'm looking back through stuff that's just been dropped down to me, a random conversation started this whole topic off for me. And I'm now in like what my fifth or sixth week of talking about it. And I've interviewed people and, and you know, all these sorts of things. And it's just really beginning to kind of, again, I feel like I'm being aligned universally. Um, to be sharing this message and at the same time the universe is empowering everybody to be able to listen and to be able to hear and to be able to lay their own foundations on an individual level and to be able to take the information and to use it and to discover more and to do your own research and to find out all the stuff that you need to know because it's not just about listening to about somebody else it's about you empowering yourself and you going out there and grabbing what you need to be able to grow and to be able to rise and to be able to ascend through the reality that you're experiencing at the moment and into a higher plane where you are fully abundant and you are consciously aware and living life in the now, you know, and paving the way as you as you live in the now, paving your way for the future in that sense. All right. Living a lot in the past, living a lot in the future. It's all about the now. It's only ever about the now. Now is the only reality. The past can be misconstrued. It can be looked at differently. The future is not even here. It doesn't matter how much you plan for it. It will still be something different than you expected. The now is the only concrete thing that we have. And so when you start to get in these little messages in your now, I encourage you to kind of really read them, hold them, uh, explore them research you know find the stuff that comes to you because that's the thing as well when you open yourself up for it and you look out for it this stuff comes to you if you're open-minded to it if you're looking for anything that you think might be supportive of where you are right now where you need to be where you want to go what you're learning about the thoughts that you're having the environment that you're in anything like that and you're looking for some sort of sign keep open to it keep looking and you will receive something um 
So yeah, last month we had a new moon on the 13th as well. So the energy is continuing on in this month and balancing out the divine, masculine and the feminine because it's rising up with the feminine and balancing out the bug because they have to be able to move together. So I feel like it's all about the divine feminine. It's rising the divine feminine uh, in all the stars, in all the numbers and everything that we're seeing. So I'm going to share the video with you in a moment. Again, I just really want you to thank you for listening. Um, thank you for participating. Um, and I hope that you're beginning to kind of feel like you can bring some of the characteristics or lean on some of the characteristics from the masculine and the divine feminine and really begin to nurture these within you. You know, if you are somebody who is uh, very career minded um, and very driven in that one aspect, open up the other half of yourself, open up that other part of yourself, do something creative. Do something that's loving towards yourself. Build a regular practice into your day. And this, you know, start slowly. Start something once a week that invites you to build into the divine feminine. And then try and make it a daily practice. Because honestly, this stuff needs to be done for yourself daily. And it needs to be done throughout the day to keep bringing yourself back into alignment. Because we're talking about changing millennia of internal, in-ground memory, um, soul recognition, uh, you know, patterns, all those sorts of things, not just from this lifetime, but from lifetimes before us, where we bring through the knowledge that we've taken from our previous lives. And since the divine feminine has been repressed for so long, the likelihood is that you're going to be bringing in memories and past experiences from previous lives that will be affecting you one way or the other in this one as well. So it's, it, it's perfect time for self-growth. It's the perfect time to be looking at yourself and healing and growing and feeling. Yeah, that feeling, that self-love, looking after you, you know, self-development, looking after you, building yourself up from the inside and then projecting it outside, utilizing both forms of energy to be able to do that, utilizing the characteristics of both forms of energy to be able to bring them both up together. So there is no imbalance. There is no crazy tipping one way and tipping the other and arguing in the middle. It just becomes this beautiful unison, this unity of, and, you know, of the divine masculine, the divine feminine, the energies that essentially equate to pure love rising up and changing our world thank you so much for listening I look forward to speaking to you all again next week enjoy the video any questions please post uh, please check in on the page on the conscious consumer network page i think i've got issues with my website at the moment so perhaps don't go through there but you can contact me on this happy guru via facebook as well um, and if you've got anything to add to it I'd, I'd really love to hear from you i really hope you enjoy the video namaste Hello everyone, it's Tanya Gabrielle, Wealth Astrologist. Welcome to your new moon partial solar eclipse in Cancer Astronomology Forecast. Now this one is important because it starts a series of three consecutive eclipses. Usually we only have two, so this is quite rare and it's going to make this summer really sizzling because eclipses really hold an energy that is intense and transformative. So this one in Cancer is so beautiful. Wait till you hear what's going on with the combination of stars. But first let me look at the date because it happens on July 13th. And that is universal time, by the way. That's in London. That's 3.48 a.m. in London. And the number 13 is associated with the moon because we have 13 lunar cycles in a year. We have 13 weeks in a season. So the number 13 is actually associated with the divine feminine, the cycles that the moon goes through, the natural earth cycles, right? So when we have an eclipse, which is a lunar solar event, happen on the number 13, the synchronicity makes it even more powerful, more intense. Now in the Americas, it happens on July 12th, late in the day, at 10.48 p.m. Eastern Time and 7.48 p.m. LA Time. But because Universal Time is the time we go by, that number 13 actually will affect all of us for this eclipse. Last month in June, we also had a new moon on June 13th. So the energy of the divine transformation, the balancing out of the feminine and masculine in all of us is continuing. Now, 
this new moon eclipse happens at 20 degrees in Cancer and the number 20 is super sensitive. It's all about bringing things into balance, intimacy, relationships, peace. And 20 is made up of 2 and 0. And the 0 is the zero point, the alpha and omega, the, the, the number of God, the number of bringing together the unseen and the seen. And Cancer is ruled by the moon. So this is very much about your, your feelings. This is a time to really feel empathy. Cancer and the moon govern motherhood and compassion and nurturing. It's the mother principle. So again, there's a feminine aspect here. There's, there's feeling is fluid. Feelings are very watery and Cancer is a water sign. And later you'll see how the water element is really emphasized during this eclipse. Now, any new moon solar eclipse is about planting new seeds and it's about refueling you in some way. It's about laying a new foundation as you're reaching outward and vitality increases and as we go towards the full moon that's when we build and build and build, right? So let me now talk about the first really amazing event that happens. We have a grand trine which is the most fortunate sacred geometric aspect in astrology. In this case, the grand trine is between the actual sun and moon eclipse forming a trine with Neptune and a trine with Jupiter. And they're happening in the water signs, Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. So Jupiter trine Neptune, which forms one leg of this triangle, is active for most of the year. It's one of the defining transits of the year, and it brings many blessings. It is very creative, very loving, very much about extending happiness beyond where you could even imagine. It's, it's very blissful, and it triggers your imagination, the flowering of your imagination, and the flowering of abundance, because Jupiter expands fortunate events, and Neptune reaches everywhere. So it's the expansion of abundance magnified, accessing higher wisdom in a natural, easy way, because Jupiter rules higher wisdom, and Neptune is very spiritual. So you just feel really, really good with this trine. So it's being activated now by this eclipse in the three water signs. So your intuition and spirituality are so enhanced right now. It's really a, an incredible time to tune in at a soul level with source, with the universe, and just create. Let that divine intelligence flow through you. You are really... <laughs> able to channel now and in a way that is very pure because water cleanses water you know we we bathe with water water is what we drink to clean our the internal body and the out and and outside our body so it is really a beautiful healing element in astrology the water signs i'm going to get to another grand trine in a moment but first i want to mention that there's one aspect that creates some tension and it's always good to have a little tension and that tense aspect is that Pluto is opposite the Sun and Moon. So the Sun and Moon are in this tight, obviously, eclipse, new moon eclipse, and Pluto is opposite them. And that brings a lot of emotional purging. Pluto transforms us. Pluto is life, death, rebirth. And Pluto is very powerful. It represents the structure that really controls how we decide to rule how we decide to lead. So when Pluto is engaged with any lunar event, it transforms us from the inside out. And in this case, your family is, your home and family life is affected in a big way and your relationships are affected in a big way because of the 20 degrees, the, the two people coming together, intimacy. So now here's the other thing. Your career is also emphasized because Pluto is in Capricorn and has been, will be for a long time. But Capricorn is a sign obviously opposite to Cancer. It's a cardinal sign, just like Cancer is. And cardinal signs really are about forward momentum and action. So Capricorn rules responsibility. It rules work, your, a good work ethic, being disciplined, paying attention to signs that come at the right time. Capricorn is governed by Saturn, which is Kronos, which is time. So it's like the timing is right. So, you know, getting on with things. And it governs your career. So your professional and personal life, home life, 
are both affected by this powerful eclipse because of these transits that are happening. Now Pluto's energy is very similar to the number 18 and 18 figures greatly in July because July is an 18 universal month in 2018. So we have a double 18 energy going and 18 is a number of release, letting go, stepping up into higher wisdom, getting more rest, focusing on healing. So when we combine this transformative Pluto opposite the new moon partial solar eclipse energy with the number 18, it really is about rebooting you energetically and empowering you. Pluto also encourages emotional assertion, okay? So there is a sense Pluto rules Scorpio. So you, you, if you know the Scorpio energy, you know it gets very deep, very unconscious. It brings it to the, to the surface so that we can look at the truth and the truth then sets you free. Pluto is very similar to that energy. Uh, and it's a very powerful energy because you don't want to hurt people with the truth. You don't want to control people with the truth, which is the shadow side of Pluto and Scorpio. You want to come through and let the truth inspire you to lead in a conscious, wise, loving way. So the whole emphasis with this opposition being activated is that you release the past Cancer really is involved here with, you know, letting go of past paradigms here, releasing that emotional baggage, and you need to let it go in order to create space for new feelings, for new experiences, for new projects, right? That reboot, that revitalization energy of the eclipse. So you're laying some kind of new foundation in your life at this time. You're planting new seeds while refueling your own energy. You're making room for beautiful new creative energy that's going to totally revitalize you. And then to help with this process, we have a second grand trine, which is so unbelievable. It's so cool. It's so rare to have two grand trines in a lunar event. In a, in a moon event, that this second one is Venus and Uranus and Saturn are trying to each other in the Earth signs. So we've got water and we've got Earth. And water and Earth, the water trine and the Earth grand trine, both of those grand trines are very harmonious with each other. Water and Earth get along super well in terms of the elements. And in this case, Venus, Uranus, and Saturn in the Earth signs means your dreams are fulfilled your dreams are manifested and grounded because it's earth when you are diligent and create a secure space for your creativity to flow for you to be listening to your intuition which is uranus beautifying your surroundings and feeling the luxury and pleasure of life which is venus and also the, the love in your life and then saturn makes it all just work right getting down to business so this will, again, impact your career because Saturn's involved. Saturn rules Capricorn. We've got Pluto and Capricorn opposite the new moon. So Capricorn's really figuring into this whole Cancer uh, new moon solar eclipse experience. So you want to allow any breakthroughs, breakups, <laughs> anything to do with cracking you open. Uh, you need to allow that to happen so that, 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 the, that the new vision that you see, the new window, the new view starts forming and you can see into the glorious future and present that you hadn't perceived before, right? This is really exciting. So trust your intuition, be free to explore. That's Uranus. Venus makes it all productive and abundant, sense of love, generosity, beauty, very artistic. Uh, this, this grand trine is amazing. And I want you to also take a look at the eclipse chart on the right, so to my left. Um, there are two equilateral triangles that are forming a six-pointed star. So this is really a star that's being born through these two grand trines in the earth signs and the water signs. Now there's one more transit I want to share that is wonderful and that's between Ner Neptune and Mercury. Uh, Neptune's at 16 degrees Pisces during this eclipse, Mercury at 17 degrees Leo. And they form what's called a quincunx or in conjunct. It's 150 degrees. And 150 degrees is what I call the genius aspect in astrology. And so in this case, it the enlightenment arises through, you really feel enlightened through soul-inspired expression. So you want to disconnect around this new moon 
at some point from the run of the mill, get things done, blah, 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 and listen, be quiet, be very sensitive, spend time in a sanctuary setting, whether it's at your home or in nature, somewhere you feel secure and emotionally uplifted. And you want to tune into other worlds, into other dimensions, to your guides, to the universe, to spirit, to source, and have an intimate conversation. And this is a brilliant time for you to unleash your inner genius. Okay, so really know that this is possible in so many ways. And since you're recalibrating because this new moon eclipse is opposite Pluto, there's rebirth, there's recalibration, it really is a new chapter in your life. And remember, we're also mid-year now, right? We are starting July, which is starts the second half of the year. So it's a celebration of the next six, mo six months. We're in 2018. I mentioned that earlier, but 2018 adds up to 11. That's the portal new beginnings in many ways and being present completely present so this new moon eclipse the first of three eclipses there's one more in july and one in august is setting the stage for your second half of 2018 to be only lived in the present moment where your imagination your intuition your creativity are completely focused on just this moment right now because nothing else matters the past cannot influence you when you are channeling when you are present when you feel timeless and you're doing something where you lose track of time you are totally present and that is the energy that we are tuning in more and more and more and it allow it allows for letting go naturally really there's no effort when you are present the healing happens super fast in an instant when you are present Right? It is when we hang on to the past and want to do things the way we did before, that's when we run into trouble because nothing, everything's changing so fast now, you, you actually cannot use those old ways that you've gotten accustomed to as a security blanket anymore. So, and, and that's a good thing because adjusting to change takes being completely engaged in what's happening to you right now. You know? so, um, and then you can be open, then you can be free because you're not choosing based on what you've been told. You're basically making a choice based on being an independent, sovereign being. So it's a, such a gorgeous new moon eclipse, and I hope you love the energy as much as I do. That, that star that's in the heavens between the earth and water signs is, is, is like a gift that accompanies the eclipse. So, you know, we're really being given something quite glorious on July 12th and 13th here. Lots of love in the meantime. Bye-bye for now. Humanity has been on an epic journey of discovery, learning the truth about the world we live in. New discoveries about the true origins of humanity ancient history, free energy, as well as the systematic corruption of world governments are now on the forefront of our daily reality. Is the world headed towards destruction based on control and power? Or is an opportunity now being presented to shift and uplift into a higher consciousness? My name is Mel V, co-founder and creative director of Conscious Consumer Network, an independent broadcast network that was launched on the 1st of January 2015. In the last three years, Conscious Consumer Network has broadcast over 2,800 shows in multiple languages, featuring guests from across the world, whilst creating media that is aimed at the creation of a free, fair, peaceful, just sustainable world. Conscious Consumer Network provides full training and an interactive support network for all broadcasters and we are always looking for inspiring and educational content. Hi, this is Lainey Liberty. And this is Mira Siegel. In 2018, Conscious Consumer Network has expanded to multiple broadcast locations, increasing our availability and reach across the world, remaining on the cutting edge of independent media. If we wish to create a better world, we must first create better media, geared towards real education instead of indoctrination. 
You guys really are what changing the world is going to be about. It's educating kids at a grassroots level. Having become a pillar of stability in the turbulent world of independent media, we have even more going on in 2018. Conscious Consumer Network is a publicly funded network and we rely on all of you to keep us on the air. Show your support for independent media by donating to our 2018 Network Support Fund. Dare to seek a better world. Support independent media.